I want you to turn with me to the Word of God. A very important part of the most important part of any meeting is God's Word. And I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 53 and then we're going over to the New Testament uh, for uh, some verses there. Isaiah 53, this great chapter of the death of Christ, and it's, uh, we're reading from the verse 5, where it refers to him 900 or 750 or 800 years, uh, at least, before he came to the cross to die. We have these words penned by the evangelical prophet Isaiah. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Turn over to Acts chapter 8, please. Take your time if you have your Bible or Testament. If you haven't, just listen to the word. Acts chapter 8 and the verse 26. This is Philip the evangelist that's speaking about here. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scriptures which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scriptures and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on the way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he, that is the eunuch, went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. And we know the Lord will bless to us the public reading of his word. I'm sure as you know and often hear on the news, Gaza is on Israel's 
West Bank. Uh, today it is a city massively populated and under great political strife and contention. But if you go back 2,000 years to this scene here that speaks about the road down to Gaza, it was an inhospitable desert terrain, just a small settlement of Bedouin Arabs uh, who hacked out a living in the fields and land uh, around them. I want you in your mind's eye now as we bring a short message this evening, I want you on your mind's eye to lift up your eyes onto the hills northward towards Jerusalem if you're standing at Gaza. And you will notice if you look, you will see the dust of the sands kicking up into the air. And as, as this crowd draws closer, you will notice further that there's a horse-drawn chariot and there's a man sitting up in the chariot and is surrounded by horsemen and soldiers. And inside the coach, reading the scriptures, the word of God, is the chancellor of the exchequer of Ethiopia. He was a man, the Bible says, of great authority. And he was second in command to Queen Candace. And it says, all her treasures. This was one of the wealthiest countries, if not the wealthiest countries in the world at this time. Now this man and this retinue of uh, travelers that are coming down towards Gaza... They're not coming from an excursion in the holy land of sightseeing. They're not coming from the city of Jerusalem from some monetary conference that he was heading up. They're not coming from some G7 or G8 summit. Somewhere they've been up there discussing the monetary situation of inflation or deflation. And as they come down, let me say this, nor is he reading the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Jerusalem Post. He's reading a manuscript inside this carriage, this coach. He's reading a manuscript, this mighty man, a manuscript of 800 years nearly old where we have read in Isaiah 53 tonight. He's reading the same words that we have read together. What took this man to Jerusalem? Well, none of those things that I spoke about took him because it's a 150 mile each way, a 300 mile journey from Jerusalem to Ethiopia to where he, his headquarters were. But verse 27 tells us why he was up there. He went there to worship. Now, this wasn't long after, and he may even have been there for Pentecost. But he was there and we don't know what he witnessed. He may have witnessed the crucifixion and the resurrection. He may have met with some of the 3,000 souls that were saved. But coupled along with his worship and the reverence and homage that this man was paying was curiosity. I have no doubt that he was curious as many were to what was happening and what was going on in Jerusalem at this time. Maybe you're in this meeting tonight and you're here just because of curiosity. Maybe you're curious to know what a baptismal service is all about. Maybe you're here because you were invited because somebody belonging to you is being baptized. You may be here for some other reason I don't know tonight, but you're in this house of God tonight, and you're under the word of God tonight, and God wants to speak to you tonight, whoever you are, saint or sinner, God has a word for you tonight. I remember the night that Pat, my wife, and I sat in the Donegal town of Bundorn, when she said to me, I would like to go into a Protestant church to see what they're like inside, pure curiosity. 
And you know these curious things and can draw us and the Lord has a way of drawing us. Remember Zacchaeus, he ran up the tree and he wanted to see Jesus. But you know what happened to Pat and you know what happened to Zacchaeus? You see, there was a pull going on in this man's life. The Spirit of God was working in this man's life. There was a hungering, there was a quest for fulfillment that his job couldn't provide that all the money that he had couldn't provide, that his prestige or, or, his, or his position couldn't describe. Old Augustine said there's a vacancy and a void in the heart of every man that only can be filled by God. And maybe tonight we're speaking to you and you have money and you have houses and you have cars and, and you have everything that you could have, but you have no peace. You have no joy within your soul tonight because you haven't Christ in your heart. God has set eternity in the heart of every man and woman. And no matter who they are or what they do or where they are, there's not only their conscience, there's an eternity set in their heart. Every man realizes sometime, some way, that the end is not just when you die. There's an eternity. The only place that you're going to find peace tonight and rest tonight and joy tonight and satisfaction tonight is in this old book. And in fact, the only place you're going to find it is where we have been reading and that has been at the cross. The place of the scriptures that this man was reading was Isaiah 53 and 7. A man led as a sheep to the slaughter, a lamb before his ears is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. He's reading just at that moment, divine by the sovereign will of God, that this timing would be so perfect. He may have read through the prophecy of Isaiah. He may have read through many chapters. Maybe he had only the prophecy of Isaiah. If he had, he had to pay for it, for the very hard to get. And he, he, it was the Greek Septuagint, and he was reading this about this Lamb of God before shears was done. And, of course, he was reading about Christ that you'll see in a moment. Old Bickerstaff penned the hymn, that, that, one, that wonderful and mighty hymn, Peace, Peace, within our heart. Only Christ can give you that peace. Right from the start, he can give you peace, peace and joy in your heart and in your soul. And so there's a, there's a real truth here that this man was searching for something more. What this man saw and what he did over in Jerusalem, we don't know. He may have been in the outer court of the temple. He may have seen the lame man leaping and walking and praising. We don't know. But what we do know, that he's coming home from the city of God. He's coming home and is back towards Jerusalem. He's coming down into dark, dark Ethiopia. He's coming down from all the rituals and traditions and sacrifices that went on up at Jerusalem. All the Pharisees and their gowns and their garments and their phylacteries and their bells and their incense. And he's coming down. He's coming away hungry. He still has no peace. He is still not saved. He's coming home empty. He's 50 miles into his journey. He has another hundred to go. And his soul is as dry as the desert sand that the horses are kicking up around him. You see, friend, ritual and religion cannot satisfy your soul. I wonder how many people came out of houses of worship this morning out in Northern Ireland and they came away hungry and come away empty. I wonder how many came home and they're still as empty as when they went and they have nothing in their heart and nothing in their soul. You can go to worship and come back empty. I wonder is there an emptiness and a void in your heart and in your soul tonight? Many people today across this land this morning they heard sermons on the Incarnation. They heard about the child and the manger and the wise men and the shepherds and all that goes with it. And thank God for those great seasonal truths. I love that we tax and I preach it sometimes in the open air this time of year where Samson's parents asked, they said, what shall we do with the child? You know, the people don't mind the child. The world out there doesn't mind the child that get a wee... A wee uh, 
uh, idol of Christ as a baby and they'll put him in a cot and they'll put a bit of holly round it and, and they'll put a bit of stuff round it and they'll all come round it and they'll all sing and some of them will be drunk. You see, the Bible says that he's a song of the drunkard. And people will leave, leave certain churches at midnight and go into their churches, not only Catholics but Protestant churches, they'll go in for the midnight service on Christmas night drunk. Oh, how merciful the Lord is. He's coming home and he's empty and he's coming home and he's dry and he's coming home. I wonder where if the 3,000 souls were saved in Pente- at Pentecost. I wonder where all the were. Was there nobody to witness to him? Was there nobody to speak to him? But thank God he got a copy of the Scriptures. Thank God for the Word of God. Oliver McAllister, in that wee book of his, I'm not sure if he says it in his book, but I've heard him testify in this church that he drove, driving a bus in Belfast, and he drove to East Belfast with a hunger in his soul and a longing in his heart. He really didn't really know what it was, and he went into a wee bookshop and he bought the Scriptures. And thank God he got the Scriptures. Thank God Pat got the scriptures. Thank God I got the scriptures. Thank God you that are saved tonight got the scriptures. The word of God was opened up to you and faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank God the eunuch had the scriptures. He had the gospel right before him. You know, you can have the Bible and not be saved. There's a wee fella down, wee boy down in Dara, in Dara, outside Derragonley where I lived and uh, he was... He's dead a long time. He, I never seen him without a pipe in his mouth. Some, most of the time it wasn't lit, but he had a pipe in his mouth. He would never use a bad word because he, was a, he belonged to a church and he, wouldn't, he went every Sunday. But you know, he'd, he'd see him staggering about drunk on a Saturday night. And after I got saved, I knew him from when I was a child. I went in to visit him one day and I said, Willie, we're having meetings, will you come? He never come near the meetings. Oh, he says, I have the Bible in the house, he says, and I read the Bible. And you know what he did? He brought me up, he lived on his own. He brought me up the stairs, and there beside his bed, on the bed, the locker of the bed, was the Bible. He says, there's my Bible. I don't know if he had ever opened it for long, for, as long for me opened it. You see, he can have the Bible. And this man has the scripture sitting on his knee in the chariot. But he's still not saved. You can have all these things, my friend, in the Word of God and all the relics and everything else in your house and you go to hell. That's what the Bible teaches. An old man came from Jerusalem down to Jericho and fell among thieves. And two other men came down after him and they had nothing for him. You can leave the house of God and the place of God and go home tonight without Christ and without joy and without peace and without sins forgiven. Very sad. Very sad. There come a moment when this man pulled the reins. He pulled the reins on the whole shebang and he stopped the whole procedure on the road and he held tight. I want, listen, God's maybe pulling the reins. You time you pull the reins tonight. Some of you here or some of you listening to me in some place or some other way tonight and you're on the road downward and you're going fast downward and you're going to hell and it's time you pull the reins because you might never get another chance after hearing this message. Stop the whole procedure. Stop your whole sin and business and turn to Christ tonight and seek him while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. And as we draw to a close with this message tonight, there's a couple of things here that I want to call your attention to. First of all, there was the preparation. The preparation. God was preparing all this. You see, this was a divine appointment. Wasn't it a good job that Philip came to this man? Isn't it a good job that God sent Philip, that heaven sent Philip to this man? Isn't it a good job some of the old modernist, humanist clergy didn't get at him? I tell you that it put the hunger out of him. You see the questions that he was asking. The eunuch asked, 
Does Isaiah speak of himself? Is he speaking of himself? Or is he speaking of some other man? He asked Philip. Now these modernists and humans would say, no, no other man. There's no other man here. It's just an allegory. It's a picture. It's a story. It's poetic. He's speaking about himself. When I went into Bible college, I wasn't long into it. We were studying the book of Isaiah. They told us, now remember, there's two Isaiahs. I had a problem with one of them. There's two Isaiahs. They tell you there's two. I don't care. There's 102 Isaiahs. Isaiahs. This boy's reading in Isaiah 53, where Christ was crucified at the cross. Oh, what a chapter that 53 is. He, he, he's reading that. There's a preparation that I probably said to him, listen, you're too long out in the sun. You're, you're fatigued. You, you're too long a journey. You're mixed up in your mind. Get that book out of your road. That book that is the cause of filling mental institutions to tell us. Get that book and banish that old book out of your road and start to talk about something else. Talk about the financial times and the state of things. But oh, this man had a hunger, and this man had a thirst, and this man had a longing in his soul. There was something going on in his heart. I wonder, is there something going on in your heart and soul tonight? Is there a quest for peace? God saw the heart of this man, and he knew the right man to send to him. And Paul, when, Pete, when Philip opened his mouth, there's a whole lot of boys that need to keep their mouth shut for they've nothing to say about salvation, nothing to say about the cross, nothing to say about the blood, nothing to say about resurrection, nothing to say about Paul. I'll tell you, Philip had plenty to say. There was a preparation. Secondly, there was an expedition. Expedite. It says that he, he said, verse 30, Philip ran. Ran. You see, this man's at a crossroads. When he comes to Gaza, he's at a crossroads. He has to swing left across the shore of the River Nile and down and way down another hundred mile to Ethiopia. He's at a crossroads at this very spot at Gaza. He's at the crossroads. Now you're at a crossroads tonight. You don't have me to tell you that you're at a crossroads. You're at two ways tonight and you have to go one way or another. And once this man would have swung around and got away down there, that was it. But you see, God wasn't only after the man. You see, whenever God starts dealing in a life, he's not just the individual that he's after. Father, it's not only you he's after tonight. Mother, it's not only you tonight. It's your children and your family that he's after tonight. Oh, Philip went there to an individual, surely did, but God had a bigger picture than that. And I'll tell you how big the picture that was, that whenever this man got saved and gloriously saved and went on his way rejoicing, he went down into Ethiopia and he spread the gospel until Ethiopia was, had thousands of converts in it. He brought revival down into Ethiopia. There was a word in the scripture that says Ethiopia holds out her hands. She was holding out her hands for life, for truth. This man brought it. This was the man. This was the man to evangelize and bring revival down amongst the dark people of Africa. God's ways are not our ways. God can take a soul and he can take a man and he can take a woman and you think that nothing's happening and he saves that man and he saves that woman. But oh, I tell you, God has big plans. He has big plans when he takes someone out of darkness and brings them into light. He sees the big picture. And he not only wants you tonight, he wants your family tonight. He wants you tonight maybe to be the one that will bring revival to Ireland. His plans are big. And wherever you are, and thank God we have more people, another letter the other day, two internets, on one day, another letter the other day, where God was speaking to them about, about things in their life. Is he speaking to you about things in your life? Oh, he had the big picture. The real big picture. And Philip, Philip ran, he ran. The king's business requires haste. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Man, run, flee man from the wrath to come. 
Philip ran. Right ran, he ran. And then God said to him, go near and join yourself onto the chariot. And an invitation came from this man. The invitation came for, from this man. He desired Philip to come up and to sit with him. I tell you, one of them guards men could have took the head of Philip. This boy coming from the desert out of nowhere and to come into a man with such prestige, such power. This great man, mighty man with all the authority of Queen Candace and with charge of all her treasures. But God was in this. And God has to be in it, my friend, if souls are going to be saved. It has to be God's time. It has to be God's way. And wherever God's in it, there'll be no problem with reaching the man or the woman, no matter who they are. And, and he says, he desired him, that word desired, he cried out urgently, invoked him, can you come up and help me? You see, there's a hunger in the soul which we don't see so much of today. Isn't it strange how people can sit week after week and year after year in meetings and hear the gospel and know their need to be saved and know fine well that there's a hell and a burning hell and yet it doesn't shake them. But this man has a hunger. He has a desire. He wants somebody to help him. There's a conviction in the soul. And when a man or woman gets desperate enough and cries out to God, I'll tell you, God will be there. I have found that over 52 years, he'll be there. He was there. It says, then Philip opened his mouth. When he got up into the coach with him, it says, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scriptures to preach unto him, Jesus When, then, then, when, when he was ready, when he was ripe, when he was hungry, he preached unto him Jesus. He didn't preach unto him Lord. He didn't preach unto him Christ. He didn't understand those things. He knew nothing about those things. But he preached unto him, first of all, that comes first of all, Jesus, which is Savior. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what Christmas is all about. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Not a ruler, not an advisor, not a politician, thank God. Not a scientist, thank God. For they have done us enough harm, but unto us a Savior. God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. This man needed a Savior. Whether he was black or white, it didn't matter. Whether he was rich or poor, it didn't matter. Wherever he was from, it didn't matter. He needed the Savior. God knew what he needed. And he knew the scriptures he needed. And just the timing was so perfect. Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. He preached unto him Jesus. <laughs> How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. He didn't sing to him. He didn't strum a guitar and there's nothing wrong with that. He didn't sing, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. No, he preached. That's what the word of God said. He preached. There was a proclamation. He preached the word. He preached the cross. He preached Christ died and rose again. And he must also preach the full, of, the full great commission. Listen, there's a close. He told them how to be saved. He told them that Christ, the Lamb of God, will take away his sin. He told them this is, this is another man. This is the man, Christ Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our This is him. This is him. This is the only one. There's neither salvation than any other. It's only him. That's what Philip would have preached. That's why Philip was seeing revival down in Samaria. God called him away from revival to come to one man. No, not to one man, to a whole nation. He must have preached the Great Commission because he would obey the Lord. And you that are getting baptized, now you just hold on a wee minute. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
Baptize every creature. This is a creature. This is a man that needs, he needs saved. He needs his sin forgiven. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. There's not one word of baptism in Isaiah 53. He didn't take a baptism out of Isaiah 53. Nobody preached the whole commission. You see, in those days, and for the first 2,000 years, was it? No, the first 500 years or something of the church, uh, every time somebody was saved, they were baptized in the early church. It was part of the gospel. It's the part of the gospel message. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, every, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Ghost. And baptize means baptism. It means to go down under. That's why we have a tank of water here. You don't tell me that this man and all these men around him wouldn't have been in the desert without water. That they had bottles and jars of water. They could have sprinkled the whole country. But the word baptism means to go down under. And then he pulls the chariot up. He pulls the reins in the chariot. And he said to Philip, he says, here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? Now, I don't know where the water came from in the desert. I don't know whether it was a river or a pool or a lake or where it was. But wherever they were at this time, but then God's in this, there was the water. And he says, what hinders me to get baptized? There's the water tonight. What hinders you that saved for years that you're not baptized? What excuses do you make? This man immediately, he was gloriously and wonderfully saved through the preaching of the gospel, through the preaching of Jesus, the Savior, the Lord, the only one. He was wonderful and gloriously saved. The burden lifted and the joy came into his soul because it says he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip says, when he says, what hinders me to be baptized? Here's what Philip says. If thou believest with all thine heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In other words, the one hanging on this cross, the lamb before her shears, this man who was bludgeoned and beaten and crucified at Calvary, do you believe that he's the Son of God? Do you believe that he's the creator and the sustainer and the provider of all things? That he's God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man? That this wee baby in the manger is God? Do you believe that? And do you believe that this wee baby came and grew up to a man to 33 and a half years of age and they stripped him and they hung him on an old cross and they nailed him to an old cross? Do you believe that on that cross was the Son of God, God's Son? Do you believe that it was him? And he says, I believe. Do you believe that tonight? I tell you, if you're not saved tonight or today or wherever you're listening to me at whatever time of the day, it says, let me tell you, if you're not saved and you believe that Jesus Christ came into the world, the creator, eternal, the creator of all things, that he came into the world and he came to a baby of span's land to the matrix of the virgin's womb, just a baby of span's land. And I tell you, if you believe that he is the son of God and you're not saved, you're in dangerous ground. You believe that he grew up and men spat on him and kicked him and beat him and hung him in that old Roman jib. But do you believe that tonight, that that was God's son? Is this why you come tonight? God wants to tell you, my son died for you. He was crowned with thorns for you. His back was lashed like a ploughed field for you. And he died and he was buried and he came up again and he rose again. And on the third day, and that's what these people are doing tonight, they're identifying themselves with Christ. They're identifying themselves with the gospel. As they go down into this water, they're, they're to acknowledge to their family and others, people that are here today, they're acknowledging, I believe God and I'm saved and I'm a child of God and I'm not ashamed to own him. I'm not ashamed to go down into the water because the whole part of the Christmas story is humiliation. And let me tell you, the whole part of the story with this man is humiliation. For a man of this stature, a man of this power, and all the horsemen and all the guards and all that were around him, for him to get out and pull off his outer garments and go down into water by a stranger whom he'd never seen before and to be baptized down into that water and come up again to newness of life. Do you not think that they sniggled? And do you not think that they laughed? And do you not think that they mocked him? 
but humiliation. He humbled himself, and that's all about Christmas, my friend. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The creator, the maker of all things, became a child. Oh, what humility. What humility. Oh, God help us with all our pride. He humbled and he went down into the tank and these people are humbling themselves the night before the crowd and they're saying, I'm not ashamed of my Savior who saved me and has blessed me. And I thank God. And then Philip was caught away. And I haven't time and I'm going to preach no more. But that word Philip was caught away is the same word that used for the rapture when we're going to be caught away. Some of these days, you know, he's going to burst the clouds and he's going to snatch us out of this old sinful world. Glory to God. He's going to take us out. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Philip was caught away. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall be with the Lord forever. And let me tell you, it's coming very, very close. It's very close. The coming of the Lord. Are you saved tonight? Are you rejoicing tonight? In a moment of time, this man went down the road rejoicing and praising the Lord down into Africa to witness around him and maybe preach, I don't know, but his influence was mighty. Mighty. Ethiopia holds out her hands. Are you holding out your hands tonight? Well, if you're as desperate and as keen and as hungry as this man, you'll go home rejoicing with your sins forgiven and peace with God. Amen.